so Pablo will be talking about what he's done for the last three years and, and hopefully there'll be time at the end for questions. Um, and obviously if we run out of time, please just reach out to Pablo um, via email. I'm sure he'll be happy to chat about his work. So Pablo, over to you. Uh, okay, thanks James for that introduction. Uh, um, yeah, well, uh, do you, uh, first of all, are you seeing the screen? Can you see the presentation? I can see it my end here, Pablo. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, well, thanks, James, for that introduction. And, um, um, well, um, I have been doing my PhD here for the last almost uh, more than three years. Uh, I'm almost at the end of the of my PhD uh, with the uh, the help and advice from Martin Maroon, James Watson, Hugh Cossingham, Laura Sonter, Moreno de Marco. Um, yeah, so in this talk, I will talk a little bit about my research in the last four years. Uh, initially, I'll talk about uh, uh, ecological studies that I did for my master's on the on research I did for my, my, my PhD, and then I'll go into um, conservation and, and some of the, of the analysis I have been doing through my PhD. So um, to start, I'll talk a little bit about my past. So I, as I was telling you, I did a, a degree in biology in, in in Los Andes University in Colombia, and they did um, I did a master's in tropical ecology also at, at Los Andes University. And during this time, I I did mainly analysis and research on, on ecological aspects of, of forest ecosystems. Um, particularly for my master's thesis, I spent one year in the Amazon Andes foothills, so that is one of the most biodiverse regions in the world, taking ecological data for my thesis and. Um, uh, that was related to how changes in in fruit production along an altitudinal gradient uh, affect a uh, richness and abundance of birds and mammals. Um, so, additionally to that um, um, information I got for my thesis, I was lucky to be able to get information for an almost unknown species of of a bird from the region that was the black tinamou. So I got a lot of information and we published it and we were able to help in the understanding of this of the species ecology and also on the conservation status. So this is a, the, the first photo of the of, of the of a living individual of the northern subspecies that I was uh, that I took during that time it was really hard, but at the end I, I was able to do it. Uh, along with that, I also gathered a lot of information related to the species distribution, the subspecies distribution. So I got, I got into the uh, literature and with uh, colleagues and I got information about the species distribution, records of the species. Um, also we got, uh, we were able to uh, identify mis misidentifications and with this information we were able to find that there was a big uh, geographical gap between the two subspecies that um, uh, started to show some of the things that I will show you later. Uh, uh, back up the, the conclusions that we found. Um, additionally, we got, the, we got information on the geographical range of the two subspecies and how they were different in, in, in altitudinal ranges. And also we got information on the ecological characteristics of both subspecies. Uh, that's what is shown in the, in, the, in the right. And we found that the two subspecies were quite different as well in ecologically speaking. Um, also, uh, we found, we, uh, uh, we got the first recordings of the vocalizations of these subspecies, of the northern subspecies, and we uh, compared it to the south, southern subspecies. And we found that uh, there were the statistical significance in things like number of notes, uh, the length of, this, of the songs, and different things. And it was particularly interesting because these species, uh, in these species, the the, the vocalization is uh, genetically inherited. So differences in, in the vocalizations um, are related to genetically difference. So with all this information, we were able to suggest that the two subspecies were actually, were may, may be different species. And this has an impact in the ecology, in the conservation of the species as well, because um, this species is, is categorized as vulnerable based on the IUCN threat scheme. So changing this, the, the species to, to 
the subspecies to different species will make changes for the conservation actions needed for both, especially for the northern one that is very range restricted and has a lot of human pressures. Additionally to that, uh, we got the information on the ecology of the species, the density of the, of the popul population density of the species in the area where I did the study. Uh, and we got a, a relatively uh, high population compared to other species. But in any case, even though it's really high, we also found that there's a lot of human pressures in the area, a lot of hunting, a lot of uh, deforestation. So these um, population estimates may go, the population uh, size will probably go down if there's no, no conservation actions in, in these areas. Uh, we also got the inform information about the daily activity patterns of the species, and we found that it's more active in the late uh, morning. And additionally to that, we got information on the on the species um, vocalization activity along the year, and we found that um, particularly in the in between March and April is when the species um, March and May is when the species has more is more active vocalizing, and we thought that it was related to um, the species uh, breeding period, the mating period. Um, well, and additionally to this very focused ecological uh, assessment of this species, we also, I also was the first one to make a, an inventory for the area where I was, a uh, bird inventory for the area where I was doing the research. This was the Alto Fragua National Park. So I did the first inventory for this national park. Uh, and also I did the first inventory for mammals in the national park with camera traps. And we did a little bit of activity patterns of these species and densities. Of the different species. Additionally to that, um, in, along this time we did some vegetation plots along the, uh, the altitudinal gradient of the national park and the plots from the lower elevations were used. We used them uh, for doing some analysis related to trying to understand um, the patterns of uh, species, uh, tree species turnover in the, in the uh, lowlands of northern South America. And we found that um, um, two of the most important, the most relevant aspects are um, first the terrain. So if the if the terrain is flooded by rivers of Andes or origins or lowland rivers, or if they are from uh, terra firme, that is uh, landscapes that are never flooded, this is affected uh, uh, greatly the composition of species. So there were some plots that they were very near each other, but even though they were very near, they had different type of landscape characteristics. Some, um, some of them were fluted and, they, and the others were not fluted, and those had very dif dis distinct uh, uh, composition of tree species. But when you compare those that were from the same type of landscape, like let's say fluted um, forest, they, they could have very similar composition even though they were in different uh, uh, regions. That those are the colors in this graph. Um, additionally to that, we found that um, for that another aspect that is really important, that is relevant to the composition of forest, uh, uh, forest species is the, the soil characteristics. So we found that different um, uh, components of the soil um, drive the, the composition of, or shape the composition of, of the forest. Uh, so this is, a little bit of, of the work I did in, in my thesis and also from other research activities I did before my PhD. And with all of these, I, I also realized spending a lot of, the, of, 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 of this time in the forest that there was a lot of conservation pressures, a lot of human pressures in these amazingly diverse places. So I decided to start a PhD in conservation biology in, in UQ. Um, with the help with Martin, James, Laura, Hugh, um, and I focused on Colombia uh, and how to improve conservation decisions in the country. So first I'm gonna do a little bit of an overview of the, of the country. So Colombia has around 10% of the global biodiversity within its borders. Um, also it's one of the most biodiverse countries by uh, square meters on, on earth. And to put it on perspective, uh, Colombia is, is, is has similar um, a number of species in birds, mammals, amphibians, plants to Brazil, but in, but in, in size is one eighth 
of the size of, of, of Brazil. Additionally, it has around 55% of the country covered with forest. So I decided to uh, focus my research on the forest ecosystem because as additionally to that, forest ecosystems are the most diverse, at least in, in, the, in the tropics. Um, so uh, even though it's, uh, the country has a lot of biodiversity, it has a lot of challenges, and particularly uh, one of the main challenges the country faces in relation to conservation is the armed conflict that the country has been going through. So the country has been in armed conflict for the last 50 years, uh, but in, the, in 2015, we, the, there was a peace deal signed between the Colombian government and the strongest illegal armed group, and this was very, very positive for society, but in relation to um, conservation, it made a lot of challenges for, for the conservation of, of the forests in, in, the, in the country, particularly because a lot of the areas in the country were off limit to development because these groups were the authority in these places. But after the peace deal, these groups moved from these areas and made the, 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 the areas open for business. So we proposed that we, will, we need conservation planning in these areas before all this development comes. Additionally to that, I have been working uh, uh, with um, uh, conservation, uh, trying to understand the variables or the, the variables that check deforestation in, in the Amazon and in other uh, forest types in, in, in the tropics. Uh, so these are two uh, letters that we, that we wrote recently, one trying to show how land access inequality in the Amazon affects, deeply affects deforestation patterns and also how um, collaboration between uh, Amazonian countries um, will, it's really important to generate better conservation outcomes. Um, so additionally to that, uh, I decided to focus one of my chapters to understand uh, specifically the deforestation patterns in, in Colombia and which were the variables that shaped those deforestation patterns, patterns and, and in what ways. So in order to do that, I gather information on the deforestation drivers in in the variables that were associated with deforestation in Colombia and in, in other places of the world. And I got information from the deforestation to 2000 and from 2000 to 2015. And using the weights of evidence analysis in the software dynamic, we assessed the association of different variables with deforestation pressure. So we found that, for example, for uh, uh, in the case of these four variables, we found that proximity to mining concessions, proximity to exploited, exploited oil wells, to roads and proximity to previously deforested areas increased deforestation pressure in the country. Uh, these uh, uh, patterns have been found in other places, but especially for mining and uh, oil extraction, this is kind of the, the most strong evidence, the, one of the most strong evidence that for the country it also happens. So it has been used by different NGOs like Humboldt Institute or WWF to make conservation decisions. Additionally to uh, that, we also focused particularly on two variables that were very important for the Colombian context, that were um, armed conflict and coca plantations, and we found that the higher the armed conflict, the higher the deforestation pressure, and the closest to up uh, coca plantation, the higher also the deforestation pressure. Particularly, uh, particularly in relation to armed conflict, um, this might be confusing based on, the, on what I said at the beginning, that the peace deal they actually increase deforestation, but to put in, in, in context, what happens is that before the peace deal, a lot of these areas were under a, a control by a, by a illegal group. So there was actually no armed conflict and these armed groups sometimes even used, a, made some rules to protect the forest. But after the peace deal, a lot of these places were like, a, without that a strong authority. So armed conflict increased and deforestation as well. Additionally to that, with this information of the association of these variables to deforestation, with deforestation, we created some maps of models of deforestation models for the country. We created a deforestation model for the country, and we also assessed the, uh, the places in the country where there was a higher deforestation pressure. Based, for example, in this map is the where we places in the country where there is a higher deforestation pressure due to only and conflict and coca. So we could find the places where conflict is increasing deforestation. Um, additionally to that, we did um, a map of the deforestation pressure with all the suite of the set of variables. And with this information, we kind of already got an, uh, a better understanding of where, where, where the places that were 
having a higher deforestation pressure and we're more uh, probably, probably being, going to be deforested in the near future. So the next step I wanted to do is to understand um, how to stop that deforestation from happening. Uh, to do that, I knew that in Colombia, protected areas are the main tool, one of the main tools used to prevent deforestation and biodiversity loss. And, that, and the country has around 13% of the continent that are covered with forest. So I wanted, I asked, I wanted to understand better if the protected areas are actually preventing deforestation and how effective they are preventing if they actually do prevent deforestation. So in order to do that first, um, uh, we know that uh, the forest, uh, protected areas are not randomly distributed in space. So protected areas are normally established in places that are isolated with low population densities, uh, low productivity and high slope and other variables. So in order to understand the effectiveness of these protected areas, we needed to compare these areas with areas that are not protected with similar characteristics. So in order to do that, we use propensity square matching that basically does that, uh, matches areas protected with areas that are not protected with similar characteristics. And to do so, we divided the country on a grid cell of one square kilometers, and we got information for each pixel of, this, of the variables that we already know that were influencing the forestation patterns in the country. And we got information of uh, the drivers, uh, the forestation patterns from 2002 to 2015. Then for each pixel, we divided them between pixels inside protected areas and pixels outside protected areas. And we use propensity score matching and then to, the, to match uh, the pixels inside with the ones outside. And then we use general linear mix models to actually model the effect of, of protection, of, uh, in, of protection, preventing deforestation. So we did that for the whole country, but we also knew that the different biotic regions in, in the country had different characteristics. So that also affected the effectiveness. So we did it also for the different biotic regions. regions. And additionally to that, we wanted to get the best estimates possible, the more accurate estimates possible. So we tested different types of matching uh, methods, matching uh, protocols or ways of generating the matching pairs. So for example, we generating, generated um, matching pairs at a, global, at a national scale, and then we just uh, got the statistics for the matching pairs on the, on the different regions from the, from the national matching um, analysis, but also there's other, other methods. And so we also tested these other methods, like for example, submatching that is doing a separate matching analysis for each biotic region. And what we found is that depending on the matching method, there's different uh, estimates of, of, of uh, forest cover loss for the country. So here in green is the forest loss inside protected areas. In, in that is over the, the overall area that is not protected. And, the different colors is the, the estimate of the matching pairs that are not protected based on the different matching protocols. So you can see there's different variations. So we also tested for how good were these different methods uh, generating very similar uh, matching pairs for different variables. So in here, this is the um, indices, indices of covariate imbalance. So if they are higher than 25%, they mean that, the, that for that variable, the the matching analysis was not as good generating similarity between the pairs. So you could see, for example, for the Amazon, that submatching, subsetting is not a good method, but submatching is the best. And we found that for all the, like a, a constant. So we use sub, submatching as, as the method to analyze. And also we wanted to understand how, uh, to see the effect of spatial autocorrelation in the, in, in the model effect of protection. So we generated different, generated different models that accounted for spatial autocorrelation in different ways and, and uh, um, determine the effect, preventing, uh, accounting for spatial autocorrelation. And we, uh, with the Moran side, we detected which was the model that better accounted for spatial autocorrelation. Additionally to that, we analyzed the effect of not, of not accounting totally for spatial autocorrelation on the model estimate of the effect of protection. And we found that, for example, or in this case, let's, see the Orinoco region, the estimate is negative with the model that more poorly accounted for spatial autocorrelation, but when spatial autocorrelation is properly accounted for, the estimate becomes positive. So actually the effect of spatial autocorrelation was very significant uh, to the outcome of, of our analysis. 
Uh, so yeah, we use the best model um, and the best matching method to get the results. So here are uh, the results of actually the effectiveness of protected areas. So this is the net deforestation. So the bars show the percentage of deforestation for each protected area and the red lines, uh, the net forest loss for each protected area. So you can see that, for example, for the Andes region, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the protected areas. Some have a lot of deforestation, but others have a lot of uh, a lot of forest gain. And for example, for the Amazon, there's a lot of areas in the protected area, and Amazon are the ones that have lost the highest amount of area of forest, even though for some of those uh, protected areas, there is a low percentage of the total area of the, of the park. Uh, in relation to the actual effectiveness of protected areas, we found that in here in, in green is the, the forest loss percentage inside protected areas and the, and the gray is the forest loss in matched on protected areas. So we can see that is less deforestation in protected areas, even though there's deforestation and actually we don't want deforestation, but in any case, it's less and it's significantly less. And that difference to put it in perspective is around 40% less deforestation inside the protected areas in Colombia. In relation to the different regions, so here we're going to focus on the purple bars that are the model estimate of the effect of protection. We can see that for regions like the Caribbean region, the protected areas are very effective, but protected areas in, uh, in places like the Pacific, uh, the protected areas are actually ineffective for the deforestation. And this is really interesting in relation to conservation decisions in the country. Why? Because with this information, we can see that, for example, for the Caribbean region, Protected areas are very effective, but the protected area extent is very is low. There's not a lot of coverage, so we suggest higher coverage for the Caribbean area. But in the, in the in the opposite, for the Pacific region, uh, we proposed very uh, more investment in management for the protected areas that are already present. So that is the effectiveness preventing uh, habitat destruction, and now we wanted to know the coverage of the protected areas the coverage of the species by protected areas. So in order to do that, we got, we got information on the range maps of species um, by uh, uh, of all the vertebrate species in Colombia, birds, mammals, and amphibians. And we overlaid that with the map of, of the protected area networks in the country to, under, to know the proportion of the species range that was protected. And also we assessed the adep how adequately that proportion was in relation to the species range size. So for species, we use the adequacy, you know, this adequacy target that basically states that species that have a wider distribution shouldn't have a lot of area protected because they have more uh, higher, bigger range, while species that are range restricted will need higher protection. So the results of these uh, analysis are shown here in a summary. So here in green is the species that have no coverage. In blue is the species that have partial coverage, and in red the species that have no coverage. And the diamonds are the species that have meet the proportion of species that meet the adequacy target. Additionally, the dark colors is all species, and the bright colors is endangered species. So you could see that for amphibians, there's a lot of species that have no protection at all, and, and even more for endangered species. So this is one group that needs to be taken into account for future protected area expansion in the country. Additionally, for birds, there's a lot of species that don't meet the target of adequacy coverage. So these are, this is the other, the second group with, that needs attention. So to understand, to try to assess which, are the pla which were the places where we needed to expand the protected area network, we did, um, and, and, uh, we did some uh, species richness maps. So here is a species richness of a richness map for endangered birds and endangered amphibians, and for range-restricted species, uh, birds and range-restricted amphibians. So if you see, there's a place that is highlighted in both areas, that is the Chocó region. So basically, there's a need for expansion for the areas in this place because the actual, the actual ones in those places don't cover most of the spe uh, a lot of the species that, that we need to have better protection. Um, so yeah, that's a, a place. Also, the Sierra Nevada and Santa Marta, but that place, it's already protected. So it's um, better management in that place is needed. Um, okay, so additionally from that, we also wanted to know the impact of 
of the loss of forest on biodiversity. So we particularly focused on forest dependent species. So we gathered all the forest dependent species for the country and we got the range, the distribution maps for the species. And then we, got, uh, we generated a map of historical distribution of forest uh, for the country based on the maps of ecosystems for, the, for Colombia developed by Ether. And we generated as well a map for deforestation on 2015. And with the deforestation model that I showed you from the first chapter, we, we generated, a, generated a projection for 2040. With this information, we uh, then uh, gather information on the historical habitat loss, the net habitat loss and the proportion of, of habitat that each species had lost and the projected to 2040. And we also summarize all this information with, a loss, with the loss index. Uh, so some of the results are shown here. So here you can see the actual extent of habitat. The circles show the extent of historical habitat. The triangles show the extent of habitat in 2015. And the asterisks show the extent of habitat, in projected extent of habitat in 2040. So also you can see that they are divided by the IUCN range category. So the first thing you can see is that species that are endangered tend to have smaller ranges that that's kind of uh, already seen that's a pattern uh, already seen in other places but also we can see that there's a lot of species that are not uh, assigned as threatened that have uh, that are least concerned that have lost a, a high proportion of, of their habitat uh, now we zoom that into species that have less than 50,000 square kilometers of extent of suitable habitat and we can find that you can see that more clearly. So this is the threshold for uh, categorizing species based on the criterion, criterion B2 of the IUCN. That is the extent of suitable habitat uh, that a species should uh, have to, in order to be categorized as one of these species. Of course, there's all uh, criterions that have to be taken into account. But you can see that for the a lot of least concerned species, there's a uh, they have lost more of that amount of habitat in the country. We did that, this is for all the species, but also we did it for range restricted species, so species that have 80% or more of the habitat in Colombia. And you can see that there's some species that actually present the same pattern. A lot of these concerned species are losing, have lost, and are projected to lose a lot, um, a lot of their habitat. Um, so, also to, to summarize all the analysis in, in relation to the proportion of the species of the of each species range that all the species have lost. Here there are some histograms. So in the y-axis, in the uh, y-axis is the number of species that have lost a certain proportion of the habitat uh, in 2015 and in 2040. And the colors are the IUCN categories. And you can see that for the, the historic loss until 2015, a lot of the species still uh, have more than 50% of the historical habitat. But when, the, when we include the projection, a lot of the species will lose more than 50% of the habitat and a, um, a hyper percent, percentage of proportion of those species are endangered species. Um, also, we did it to divide it by different assemblages, dividing on the biotic region in the country. So these are the histograms here. And uh, the dotted line, sorry, I forgot to say the dotted line is the mean um, loss. Um, so you can see that regions, for example, uh, and also we calculated the loss index, that the, the loss index, what says is the X proportion of species that have lost the X proportion of their habitat or more. So in the case of the whole country, 35% of the species have lost 35% or more of their habitat by 2015. And by 2040, 43% of the species are going to lose, are projected to lose 43% or more of their habitat. When we split that by regions, we can see that the Caribbean region is one region that is highly concerning for species. In, uh, for species. So the impact of the forestation in that region has affected mostly of the species and most of the species have lost already more than 80% of their habitat. And for regions like the Pacific and the Amazon, there's the opposite uh, trend. So the species haven't lost um, a big proportion of their historical habitat. Uh, and in the, in the case of the Andes region is where we find the highest change 
between 2015 and 2040. So the projected deforestation is going to affect more species and the, the effect is going to be bigger. And finally, the maps here are showing the um, places where species have been impacted by deforestation. So the colors re represent the number of species affected by deforestation in that area. So for places like the Orinoco region, deforestation there uh, is affecting more than 230 species. So this is a place that is, needs uh, attention. That's this map in the, on the right is showing the projected deforestation. And we can see that again, that region shows us a place where deforestation is shown to uh, affect or impact higher uh, uh, number of species. We did the same for endemic species. And we found that similar trends, again, the, the projected loss has affected a lot of species, but the, the actual loss in 2015 has affected a lot of species, but the projected one is the one that's more concerning, with a lot of the endemic species being going to be projected to be affected, and a lot of them being endangered. And we found that the area where a lot with, with where deforestation is impacting more endemic species is the northern region of the northern uh, uh, region of the Antioquia department, with deforestation impacting more than tw uh, 15 species uh, by each square kilometer. Is this 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 map? Uh, additionally, to that, we assess the 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 coverage of extent of suitable habitat by the protected areas in the country, and we found that around 25% of the, of the extent of suitable habitat is protected for all species, and for endangered species is around, for endemic species is around uh, 30. So that's a good news, uh, and, and endemic species tend to have more habitat coverage. Over Additionally to that, we wanted to we focused as well on the endemic species to understand how deforestation has impacted those species that are the ones that depend more critically on, on forest cover in Colombia. And we found that, so in blue is the historical loss until 2000, in orange is the loss between 2000 and 2015, and in red is the loss between 2015 and 2000 um, and 40. And the da diamonds uh, are the a proportion of area that is has is not protected by 2015. So you can see that, for example, for these two endemic species, the Colombian wren and the style tapaculo, they are least concerned, but they have lost more than 50 per 60 percent of their habitat, circle habitat, and they are projected to lose around 80 percent of their habitat by by uh, 2040. So this is an important input for understanding better the impacts of deforestation on species and how that can be transformed into maybe changing on threat categories for some, some of them. Additionally to that, we also did this divided by, uh, grouped by plates of species or taxonomic groups. So in the left side is the ant eaters. Uh, that's a group of birds that is focused on, on eating ants. And we found that the place that is going to be more impacted again is the Orinoco um, region in Colombia, but the species haven't been that affected by the historical deforestation. Mm, in the other hand, the um, tanagers, the frugivorous birds, are more affected in the Andes, and they have been more impacted by the historical deforestation. So this is kind of a more or less all uh, I have to, to show, there's the conclusion. So, and conflict and cocoa plantations increase deforestation pressure in the country. Uh, protected areas are moderately affected preventing deforestation, but this is changes dramatically in, in, at the regional scale. The Amazon and Andes need better management. The Caribe needs expansion of protected areas, Pacific or the Orinoco need both management and expansion because the protected areas are not as, as good as, as effective and also there's a lot of species that don't have coverage in this area, particularly the Pacific region. Um, endangered amphibians have low coverage of by protected areas, and deforestation impacts non-threatened forest birds in a similar way as threatened species. So a lot of these non-threatened species have to be taken into account and have to be better assessed.
Uh, so North Antioquia is a place that is important, and the Amazon foothill is another place for for bird conservation. Uh, yeah, so that's all. So if anyone has questions, please let me know. And yeah, that's that's all for now. <laughs>